Listeners to this podcast will know about the Letters of Last Resort. That's the very strange practice by which the British Prime Minister gives his orders for nuclear retaliation from beyond the grave. Britain no longer has nuclear bombers or missiles tucked deep inside silos. Instead, all of our nuclear weapons are now on board submarines. Makes sense for an island nation, I suppose. And the beauty of a submarine is that it's almost undetectable when it's out at sea. Your enemies can't easily target it. The baddies might know, of course, where your air bases are and where your silos are. And will have missiles targeted on them, but how can they target your submarines? They're out at sea and they're on the move. And they can't nuke the whole ocean, can they? But there is one little hitch with nuclear submarines, and that's communication. If war happened, and if Britain was knocked out and went quiet, how can those submarines receive instructions? What if the Prime Minister can't communicate with the boats because he's dead? What if his deputies and everyone else in the chain of command is dead? What if there's no one left in Britain except a few people crawling out from beneath their propped up doors and mattresses saying, blimey? The submarine can't radio in and say, okay, seems like war's broken out. Everything all right over there? You've gone awfully quiet. Got any retaliation order for us? Hello? Because doing so would give away their position to the enemy. And remember, the greatest strength of the submarine is that they are hidden in the vast ocean. So whilst they can receive instructions, they can not radio out and seek instruction. And that's where the letters of last resort come into use. Inside a safe on each submarine, is a handwritten letter from the Prime Minister giving instructions on nuclear retaliation. If Britain goes quiet, if it's obvious war has started and ended, then it's time to open the safe, inside which is a handwritten letter giving instructions. Skip back through the archive and you'll find a full episode on those letters. But today we're going back in time Before the era of the handwritten letters of last resort, before Britain had its submarines, back to the 1960s and the premiership of Harold Macmillan, when nuclear Armageddon would be ordered with the help of pennies and gravediggers. has always been a bolt from the blue. You can build your bunkers, you can stockpile food and medicine, you can plan to evacuate the vulnerable and clear the hospitals and send your ambulances and fire engines safely out of the cities. You can plan for all of that and every single plan will be utterly worthless if the attack comes without warning, if it's the dreaded bolt from the blue. Your streets would be busy with shoppers and office workers, your hospitals full of the sick, your schools packed with children, when suddenly everyone lifts their head and listens. What? What's that? It's the siren. You have four minutes. Nuclear war planning always relies upon a long, long, long warning period. Planners are always generous in giving themselves weeks, even months of warning. They act on the assumption there will be a long and slow descent into war, 
as happened in 1939, when everyone knew war was coming, everyone had their eye on Hitler, and Britain got its gas masks and its air raid precautions sorted and dug trenches in the parks. Everyone knew it was coming. There were years and years of preparation. But a bolt from the blue attack whips all of that away from you. The siren would break into your nice ordinary Tuesday morning, interrupt you in the queue at Tesco or startle you out of bed with time only to turn to your wife and say what the hell and then perhaps think quickly of all the regrets you have. Now of course the bolt from the blue is a very Hollywood way of starting a nuclear war, very dramatic and planners knew it was unlikely. It was far more plausible that we'd slide into nuclear war following a period of great tension or even that we'd have conventional war first, which then escalated to nuclear. But the fact remained that a bolt from the blue was a possibility. Even if it was very slight, it was still possible, and so it had to be planned for. This surprise attack had become particularly terrifying in this era, the era we're looking at today, Harold Macmillan's era, late 50s, early 60s, because of nuclear missiles. At least in the old days, the enemy would attack by bomber, and you'd have a decent bit of warning as you saw the big heavy planes come lumbering across the sea towards you. But now, with missiles, your warning time was slashed to mere minutes. And so... The Prime Minister had to give this some thought. He wouldn't have the luxury of huddling in his war rooms, looking at the map, working out a strategy. No, because now Armageddon can be whistling through the atmosphere towards you, lightning fast. So you've got one last chance, you've got minutes to decide, what do you do? Well, the first thing you have to do is make sure you can get in touch with the Prime Minister. Remember, we're in Harold Macmillan's era here, long before mobile phones. Macmillan was actually born in the Victorian era and served, of course, late 50s, early 60s, so we have no such thing as 24-hour news, being online and connected and always in touch via mobiles and laptops. Strange, isn't it, how time leaps and gallops on that a man born in the Victorian era could find himself facing the threat of thermonuclear war. Another example of how time gallops on is that it was possible to have been alive during the Jack the Ripper murders and also have seen the moon landings. Someone could have met Jack the Ripper and also sat down to watch Neil Armstrong on TV. That blows my mind. So our man from genteel old Victorian Britain was now facing the most ugly modern threat. And how can we make sure he's always on hand to react to it? How can you make sure your Prime Minister is always able to receive the news and issue a decision in those last four minutes? Well, you could force him to stay at his desk beside a telephone, just in case. But let's be realistic, of course, he can't sit by the phone like a teenage girl with a crush. So his staff had to work out a plan for getting in touch with him if the worst happened, whilst he was, for example, out on the road in his car. No car phones in those days, remember? So the Prime Minister is not in his office, and he's not near a phone. He might be out on a motorway or even stuck in a traffic jam. How do we get warning to him that missiles are incoming? How do we reach him? The historian Peter Hennessy told us, and it's quaint and cute and almost comical. From 1962 until 1970, when the British Prime Minister was finally given a proper car phone, advisers planned to reach the travelling Prime Minister using AA radios. For non-British listeners, the AA is the Automobile Association. I believe they're called AAA in America. If your car breaks down, you can phone them and they'll send a bloke in a van out to reach you and patch up your car. 
Now, A, drivers who were out on the roads in the 60s had the same problem as Harold Macmillan. How do they get in touch with HQ? How do they know that there's a car broken down which needs their assistance? After all, they're facing not an incoming missile attack, but a, a broken down Ford Anglia. How do they hear of that particular emergency? Well, their drivers had radio links, and that was how HQ would communicate with them while they were out on the road. What a good idea, thought Downing Street. Can we possibly get in on that? So the Prime Minister's chauffeur was given a radio, same as the AA drivers. And if the bolt from the blue attack ever happened, they'd simply radio the chauffeur and say, Get Harold to a phone as soon as possible! Being out on the road, of course, the nearest phone would probably be a telephone box, not an office. So Harold Macmillan would leap from the Prime Ministerial car and bundle himself into a damp phone box and quickly ring Downing Street to give his nuclear retaliation orders. Ah, but he, there was one other problem. You need money to make a phone call. You have to insert four pennies at least. In the 60s, that was the minimum charge for making a call. Four pennies. So Macmillan's civil servants pondered this also, and one suggested that each Prime Ministerial car should have not only a radio link, but a little dish with four pennies in it, which the PM could scoop up as he ran to the phone box. One of the memos tackling this problem said, I should hate to think of you trying to get change for sixpence from a bus conductor. Well, those four minutes were ticking by. But there was no need to worry about keeping a little tray of Armageddon coins. A colleague told our worried advisor that it was possible to make a call without any pennies. All you had to do was ring the operator and ask her to reverse the charges. Now, the image of Harold Macmillan jumping to a phone box to respond to nuclear attack is just so absurd. As Hennessy says in his book Winds of Change, where US presidents and Soviet general secretaries, and later French presidents, had and have serving officers with them at all times, carrying the nuclear retaliation codes and equipment to transmit them, British Prime Ministers in the 60s had the AA and small change. And now we turn to grave diggers. What if you cannot reach Harold Macmillan? Either because the radio doesn't work, or he has lost his pennies, or the operator doesn't believe him when he rings up from a phone box saying, Now then, my good woman, this is the Prime Minister, and the end of the world is nigh. I simply must be put through to Downing Street. What if you can't reach him because the attack has already occurred and he has been killed? What then? A defence review in 1961 had raised this issue and prompted the Prime Minister to nominate two nuclear deputies who would be authorised to make retaliation decisions in his absence. He chose two ministers to be his deputies and nicknamed them in a private note as First Grave Digger and Second Grave Digger. Documents from the time state that the First Grave Digger would have to be at all times both within reach of either Downing Street or the Prime Minister's office at the Commons and also in phone communication with both of those places. This was unless the First Grave Digger had special exemption from the Prime Minister. I don't know, say he had to go to his wife's birthday party or something, he might ask Super Mac to be relieved of gravedigger duties for the evening. If the Prime Minister had to leave Downing Street or his offices at the Commons and be out of communication for a while, his private secretary would get in touch with the nominated gravediggers and the first one would go to Downing Street and on arrival confirm with the Prime Minister that he was reporting for gravedigger duty and he would sit tight until the Prime Minister had safely returned and could resume his nuclear retaliation responsibility. So that is how Britain would have dealt with nuclear retaliation problems 
in the era before submarines and letters of last resort. Arguably, the Americans and Soviets had a better scheme, with an officer constantly trotting at the president's heels with the so-called nuclear football. Although some say that's nothing these days but a hefty, horrible symbol of nuclear aggression. Maybe so, but what does Britain symbolise then with its handfuls of pennies and its handwritten letters? That we are still somehow quaint and old-fashioned? Can you be quaint and old-fashioned if you have thermonuclear weapons? As I was recording this episode, an email pinged to tell me I had a new patron. So say hello to Peter Wilson, and thank you Peter for supporting the podcast. And I've had to come back and edit that because another patron has popped up. Thank you, Martha Prankard. If you want to make a donation each month, please look at my Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash Atomic Hobo. And let me also thank Hack Green Nuclear Bunker for supporting me, Paul Jonathan Viner, Arika, Lucy Stegervald, Tom Allen and Sally Everett Brick. Remember you can find me on Twitter at Julie A. McDowell, my website juliemcdowell.com and I'm on Facebook under Nuclear Britain. Thanks for listening everyone and I'll be back on Monday with another episode.